Hello, friends and family, and welcome to the Global Pandemic Crippling Anxiety Meditation Hour that lasts 10 minutes. Uh, ground rules as usual for anyone who's stumbling upon this video. Um, I am not a meditation teacher, and this is not meditation instruction. This is just a conversation about meditation practices. Today, I wanted to talk about uh, intoxicants in general. Uh, yesterday, we discussed coffee specifically um, because it came up in my own life and my own meditation practice. But we don't usually think of coffee as an intoxicant, but it is possible for us to reconcile <laughs> coffee as an intoxicant, given that it does have uh, non-trivial chemical properties. There are other things in our lives which can be intoxicating despite their lack of chemical presence in our body. We often think of this idea of intoxicants and we immediately jump to the obvious intoxicants, drugs, alcohol, as if alcohol weren't a drug. Um, and historically that is what is meant by intoxicants. When I say historically, I am referring to the explicit rules laid down by the ancient meditation schools regarding meditation practices which either explicitly demand uh, a certain set um, of moral behaviors of anyone who engages in that meditation practice, or at least recommend uh, those particular behaviors. Most meditation schools have some variation of this, um, and this is a topic for another video, the idea of morality in general. <clears throat> There are a lot of different vectors along which you can examine the idea of um, the specific instructions regarding morality. Uh, and in particular, um, truthfulness, to speak the truth, to speak kind words. Um, it, it's often referred to as noble speech in Theravadan traditions. That idea has a great deal more to do with meditation than one might initially expect. And so it is also the case with intoxicants. Intoxicants obviously inhibit our ability to meditate in the immediate <laughs> if we try to drink a beer or even smoke a cigarette and then sit down to meditate we'll find it extremely difficult if not impossible and uh, as i've addressed before on the topic of marijuana it is even the case that days and days after having um, partaken in some intoxicant, it's often the case that we will find meditation impossible. And there is a whole field of different activities which uh, a modern person can find intoxicating. There are some obvious uh, non-chemical intoxication options. We can indulge in music, we can indulge in TV, and the go-to example lately is to indulge or overindulge in social media. So 
we go to Twitter, we go to Facebook, we go to Instagram, we go to Snapchat, um, and we struggle to fulfill a craving that social media almost certainly cannot fill for us. But those are all obvious examples. So in our modern world, all of us have overindulged in one of these things on occasion, um, even if one is not a participant of chemical intoxicants, alcohol and drugs and tobacco, one may still very well be exposed to the world of social media. And if not the world of social media, then the world of regular media, because it's almost impossible to avoid the far reaching hands of social media these days. So all of us have engaged in these intoxicating activities to some degree, and we all know them to be intoxicating. But it's much more difficult for us to accept or even identify that a lot of our regular activities are actually quite intoxicating. And I have found that some of my deepest intoxications can be to things which are generally thought of as relatively good. Um, food can be intoxicating. And even healthy food, we can become intoxicated with healthy food. And the sensation that eating healthy food gives us and the, the feelings which accompany the consumption of food and follow the consumption of food. And obviously it is possible to over consume, but it is even possible to be intoxicated in the consumption of food. And I don't expect anyone to believe that um, simply because I'm saying it. I, I don't think that it would be wise to take someone at their word on such a topic, but through the process of meditating on our physical body, on our own existence, we can uh, become increasingly aware of the effects um, that something like food has on us. And it's really non-trivial. I mean, it, it is the uh, substance which keeps us alive and our body will really react quite vigorously to anything that we put in it. And it is the same actually with sleep and sleep almost more so. So I find uh, sleep to be one of the most difficult of the non-intoxicant intoxicants. Sleep can be intoxicating because it is essentially like daydreaming for seven to nine hours every night and wild elaborate daydreams and it doesn't take much early meditation practice to realize that to some extent daydreams are the antithesis of meditation. So if we're trying to meditate on one object and our mind keeps running away and running away to something else um, and to the mind's preference, almost anything else, the mind will often prefer anything to meditation, to remaining with the meditation object for extended periods of time. And 
sleep and in particular dreams and even more particularly that state of half dreaming where we are between the dream and wakefulness we're not entirely cognizant of our surroundings but somewhat and we're drifting in and out um, this can be incredibly intoxicating and I think most of us in, during our teenage years when our sleep cycles are completely out of sync with the rest of the worlds often find that this is the, the time in our lives when it's the most enjoyable <laughs> and any additional five or ten minutes that you can get in the morning of extra sleep and that tends to be very dreamy sleep um, will be some of the most pleasurable sleep that you get all night and it is this unconscious daydream state which can be quite uh, quite difficult to identify as intoxicating we sort of know it in the world of naps and in the world of overindulging in sleep so in the same way that we can overindulge in food we can overindulge in sleep and when we do that it's obviously uh, an, intox an intoxication of sorts and we're aware of it because it's very apparent on the surface level but again it, it isn't until a person meditates more seriously for longer periods of time and more deeply that we find um, sleep in and of itself any sleep is quite intoxicating and to some extent um, can be uh, addictive so intoxication and addiction do not necessarily go hand in hand we don't necessarily get addicted to food or addicted to sleep simply because we're doing those things but it is possible and it is a, a strange realization to uh, to feel this of sleep that sleep is not only a bit intoxicating a bit addictive but also a bit poisonous that we wake up um, if we've been meditating very seriously uh, continuously for a number of days and we go to sleep very alert very awake um, very aware and we try to maintain that for as long as possible but then at some point we sleep when we wake up we find often that sleep has completely disoriented us and it has dulled that awareness and that um, precision with which we see things and feel things to a rather staggering degree and the last category to round out our 24-hour day if we have food and sleep already um, would be work <laughs> oddly enough and for a lot of us especially during the pandemic work can be particularly intoxicating it is uh, not only a form of intoxicant in that we can indulge in it but in the same way that we feel with sleep and food often the indulgence in work feels healthy that we find ourselves proud to have overindulged in work um, we find ourselves proud to have eaten a lot of salad <laughs> proud to have slept a nine hour or ten hour night and 
there there's a, a tricky quality to this, which is that there are times when it is appropriate to sleep 10 or 11 hours a night if we are sick, if we are exhausted. There are times when we need to eat more food. And there are times when it is appropriate to work longer hours, more intensely um, into the night, to wake up early and wait, work uh, heavily throughout the day. But as we begin doing so, it is this intoxicating quality of work that we feel like we're accomplishing something, that we feel like we are making progress, that we feel needed, that can cause us to push that boundary repeatedly. Day after day, we find ourselves overindulging in work. And that's when things come out of balance, that we will often find uh, ourselves balancing our overwork with overindulgence on the other end. This feeling that, oh, I desperately need this vacation. I desperately need the weekend um, is a good indication that our work cycles are not healthy. And it's often easier for us to tell when we have the metronome, the rhythm of society and the city around us to tell us when we're overdoing things. We leave the office and we find, oh, it's, it's been dark for hours and now I need to find my way home. The city is already going to sleep and I'm still at work. I haven't had dinner yet. Um, it is less obvious, much less obvious, when the workplace becomes our home and our home becomes the workplace. And it's easy to overindulge into the evening and even late into the night and to wake up early and feel like we need to re-engage with that same thing. And all of this uh, is visible through meditation to various degrees. Work and overwork and the intoxication of work will be obvious during anapan meditation. If you sit for meditation and you find you can't get half a breath in before your mind is on your job and on your coworkers and on your to-do list and on your project planning and your organizing and scheduling. That may be normal for the first few breaths of your meditation. It may be normal for the first nine minutes perhaps, but if for 10 straight minutes, you can't get away from this constantly planning, constantly trying to solve problems, constantly trying to figure out how to tackle the workday. Then it has become uh, a problem. And not always, <laughs> but if you find that you are sitting to meditate day after day and it is really uh, sitting to plan your day instead, um, it's perhaps a good indication that you can re-examine your so-called work-life balance, but um, the way that you're working with respect to the rest of your life. The other two, uh, food and sleep, are far more subtle and it will be very difficult to identify significant overindulgence in those two categories, those two activities, um, until you start meditating more. 
um, when you're meditating one or two hours a day, three hours a day, um, certainly if you uh, sit for a meditation retreat or a Vipassana course, you will find yourself um, capable of detecting those sorts of subtleties, the sorts of subtleties um, pertaining to sleep as an intoxicant or food as an intoxicant. Um, the extreme cases, however, of overindulging in sleep, overindulging in naps, overindulging in food, indulging in heavy food, too spicy food, too salty food, too sweet food, again and again and again. Uh, these are fairly obvious if you pay attention, even in just 10 minutes of anapana. Um, you will find that your body feels more difficult and the meditation feels more difficult um, when you have allowed yourself to become intoxicated by sleep and food. And uh, it, it will take some practice, but you can um, attune yourself to becoming more aware of these things and uh, the reciprocal relationship will then be that you can feel how your body is responding to your behaviors in meditation and you may change your behaviors um, not to make your meditation better but only because you're more aware of exactly how much chocolate you're eating or how much ice cream you're eating or <laughs> how much popcorn you're eating. Um, and, uh, and it may be beneficial for your entire day to sleep um, one more hour or one less hour to eat a few more vegetables or um, to, in the case uh, of one of my friends, um, it was actually the reverse for food that he was eating far too little and not enough fat and he was exhausted all the time. So this awareness can, can work in, in both directions. It's not that you will be engaging in sloth and laziness and sleeping too much and gluttony and eating too much. It's, it's not these sort of Old Testament <laughs> sort of constraints. Um, it's that there is a certain amount of sleep and food that your body, your individual body specifically, is looking for each and every day because it changes slightly but not a great deal. Um, and that w any one of us is probably not treating our body perfectly with respect to sleep and food, but that we can um, we can dial ourselves up or down according to what we're feeling and what we're aware of with respect to um, these very basic components of life, but these incredibly important components of life. Um, and meditation can help us do that. So uh, with that in mind, we can take 10 minutes. Uh, if you have your timer, you can pause the video and set it up. Um, if you don't, you can just listen to this timer. And I will start it now.
That's our timer. I hope everyone has a good day ahead of them with uh, as many naps as you require and at least one good healthy meal. Take care of yourselves and we will see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye.